Hi, my name is Craig Cowling, I'm from Earth Communities. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce to a new concept that has uh, commenced uh, in early 2012. Uh, the, the, the motivation behind this project is actually create the plan to address some of the major problems that are occurring in the world today. We as the group believe humanity has a great future, uh, but we need to be very careful and proceed with a lot of care and concern. Um, one of the things that we think is very important that globally we've got to learn to slow down. The whole world it seems to be going faster and faster without a lot of thought being given to where we are going. So slowing down is number one and number two is let's think about where we're going and why we're going there. The, uh, the information I'm going to share today is, uh, some of it's quite scary, especially if you haven't had a, a good look at what is going on globally. Uh, some of it is actually quite confusing as we get into deep into this presentation. Uh, if you haven't considered these concepts, you're, you, they may be hard to follow for the first time you look at them. But everything we're talking about today is about the well-being of this planet. Uh, we do have some very serious problems on the planet today. Uh, firstly, we'll look at the environmental problems. Um, the, just recently, we reached 7 billion people on the planet. Uh, it was only 150 years ago that we reached 1 billion people for the first time, depending on how you count human history. That took us about 200,000 years to reach 1 billion, and only in 150 years we managed to uh, multiply that by 7. They're already talking about reaching 9 and 12 billion people before we start plateauing and that increased human population is uh, putting enormous um, stresses on our ecological systems globally. Linked to population is uh, deforestation. Um, they're predicting by uh, 2050 that 90% uh, of our forests will be cleared and linked to that is the biodiversity of the planet. As you clear old growth forests, you clear many, many other uh, life forms and species on the planet. Um, also, the way we fish globally, we've, uh, our fish stocks are collapsing. Um, they're also predicting in the next 40 years that the, most of the major fish stocks in the world will be gone. Uh, for the poorer coastal countries around the world, that's going to uh, mean immediate disaster. Um, Linked to population, and many things are linked directly to our population, they're already predicting that uh, half the species on this planet will be extinct over the next hundred years. Uh, and that's one species causing millions of species to go and extinct. If, uh, if the crime being committed, is that, that is the number one crime. The, the issue that gets lots of press and um, attention globally is uh, the CO2 levels. Um, on the chart that you see on the board, uh, that goes back to 400,000 years, but you can take that chart back one million years and the global CO2 levels never went over about 280 parts per million at any time during the last million years. We're currently almost at 400 parts per million. We're increasing by three to four parts per million. So uh, over the coming decade, we'll be starting to reach the area that the scientists have been warning us uh, to, as a, the global tipping point at 450 parts per million. I've been watching this issue for some time now um, and I can't see anything globally that's indicating that we're going to slow down um, and we'll be accelerating past 500 parts per million in the next 20 years and uh, to, to an uncertain end. So globally, and they're only at the tip of the iceberg, there's many, many other ecological reasons we should be concerned. Um, but once we move, when we move on to the next side of the ledger, being the, the human created financial ledger, um, the picture's no better. Uh, the, the image I've brought up on the board has an um, uh, explanation that the richest 400 Americans actually have control more wealth than the poorest 180 million. Uh, there's a great imbalance in the, the wealth and the, of the wealth distribution in the world. One percent of uh, humans control 40% of the wealth in the world today um, and I expect that will probably grow to 1% controlling 60 over the next uh, 10 to 20 years. The reason why I think there will be a huge transfer of wealth in the coming decades is that the debt crisis in Europe is uh, will what's begin to unravel. They've been delaying it for the last year. Um, I'd be very surprised if it survives uh, through the 2012. 
Um, we'll see it starting with Greece and then through the uh, Italy and Portugal and Ireland, but all the, all the nations of uh, the Eurozone are entangled in a web of debt, and when it starts tumbling, they're going to come tumbling down. It shocks me that uh, one of the wealthiest nations and oldest Western nations in the world is, is crippled with debt uh, when really they should be um, uh, enjoying their wealth. The, um, and after Europe, America is to follow. Uh, they're currently sitting with $116 trillion worth of debt nationally, um, and it won't be long until the, the second wave of the GFC uh, comes in through Europe, uh, sorry, after Europe into America. And, and takes down both of the great Western uh, economies. What they're predicting will occur during that is the elimination of the middle class. Uh, a great amount of wealth will be transferred to an elite few at the very top end of society, and the rest of us will be uh, reduced to um, live in subsistent lifestyles. Now that's not a great picture when you look at ec uh, our ecological landscape and our financial landscape. We have some major problems globally. Uh, the chart here today talks about uh, a statement from John Holdren, and you don't have to go far on the uh, internet today to find statements from uh, very informed people that say if we keep on going the way we are travelling, we are going to come to an uncertain end. Why is it that globally we don't make better decisions? Well, after looking at this problem intensely for some years, it became very clear to me the number one reason we don't need better choices is because of this stuff, money. Um, we simply can't afford to, but not because we don't have enough money. We can make money at our will, and I'll explain that later. Um, but it's, it's our relationship with money and how it impacts on our society. Let's say in Australia we chose to reduce our population from, say, aiming for a 25 million population. Instead, we decide to go down for a 15 million population. And we'll see what the impact of that decision would mean on just one industry sector being the um, housing industry. If the governments started promoting uh, lower populations, it wouldn't be long before we didn't need to build 130,000 new homes, which we currently build in Australia. So that whole uh, construction, a uh, residential construction sector would go to sleep. That would mean results in tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people being out of work. The next carrot follow on effect of that would be the supply chain or the timber, metal, the materials that go into the houses would no longer be required and that therefore thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people would be also out of work um, and, and not being able to pay their bills. And the next step on from that would be the existing housing property uh, on the market would start devaluing because of reduced demand and it wouldn't be long before virtually everybody with a mortgage would be asking to refinance their loans and therefore one decision, just of reducing the population or slowing our economy, uh, impacts virtually everybody in, across the economy and results in ruin. Um, and you look across all the industry sectors, such as manufacturing, retail, health, education, mining and agriculture, um, they all would result in the same outcome. The minute you start slowing demand, you end up with an implosion. Capitalism only is supports itself on increasing demand and increasing consumption. If you go back 200 years, there was many uh, early co economists explaining that uh, economists, uh, sorry, the capitalistic system would end in, a in uh, environmental uh, destruction, purely for the reason uh, that we are seeing today. Uh, so currently, globally, we're locked into this cycle of producing, distributing, consuming and disposing at an ever-increasing rate. If we don't continue that cycle, money stops flowing and the um, uh, financial system collapse. The result of that, though, is we're grinding through the planet. We're at a faster and faster rate. We're, we're, we're consuming our natural resources and turning them into waste for in the endless pursuit of money. The... Um, uh, the whole concept of, of profit, um, which is, uh, is embraced by the capitalistic model, actually corrupts our ability to make good and right decisions. Um, let's look at one example of that. Let's say uh, saving the ra rainforest. Many people understand that the right thing to do or the best thing to do would be to leave them alone. Um, but the trouble is leaving the rainforest alone um, offers no profit at all. 
So the likelihood of us doing that is very, very unlikely. So the next step might be, oh, we'll, we'll harvest the forest just for the largest trees. Um, the reality is that's not as profitable as it could be, so we won't choose that option either. And so we're forever stepping away from the very best and right thing to do and forever looking for a, a more profitable solution. So the best option is do nothing. The, the option we will most likely adopt because of the world we live in is one that makes the most profit and which will be probably clear the forest and take the oil out and everything else that we can find in that area. Um, and that, that reality or that logical sequence of thinking is common across so many sectors and it's obvious if you, if you look in the pharmaceutical and medical or educational and transport systems etc. We choose profit over looking after the planet or the wider uh, the wider good for humanity. We also live in a world where we've allowed the banks to decide what happens. Uh, virtually any major project that's going to occur on the planet today um, will, will require financing from a banking institution. Now banks only have one criteria they're concerned about, which is if we give you money, we want our money back plus interest. So a bank will only fund or support a project which is profitable. Um, and therefore, uh, any project which is not profitable will not proceed in the world we live in today. The unfortunate reality is saving the planet will not, in, in our current evaluation of profit, will not be profitable and therefore, under our current models, will not occur. Um, but as we, uh, we all say, we need money and we work for money to, um, uh, to, to buy the things we need. And that's, uh, and that's been the way it has been for several hundred years. Not always, but definitely for, since the Industrial Revolution, money has become the key ex method of exchange globally. But the next logical question, if we need money to buy stuff, what is it that puts the cost in stuff? Now, if you have a look at virtually any um, consumer items, there's three main components which we put that put the cost in stuff. The first one is wages. Um, wages, we understand that if wages go up, generally speaking, the cost of things will go up because there's more cost of wages in the, in, to produce things. Conversely though, if wages come down, the cost of things can come down. So we can see that the cost of stuff and wages are actually linked. The less wages, the cheaper things would be. The next item in most, um, the next component that puts cost in things is resources, natural resources, that, and generally all resources come from the planet. The interesting thing to acknowledge is that the planet has never asked for one cent from humanity. It's never been paid a dollar for any of the resources it's given up. Uh, regardless whether we chop them down, hunt them down or dig them up, the resources are given to us freely by the planet. It's just wages and capital costs that add a, a cost to them. So when we look at the, the resources consumed in making stuff, we can actually say there's no actually direct cost there, there's associated costs in producing items. And the last two items there, money, cost and profit, are both concepts that evolved from the capitalistic system. Um, uh, the concept of property evolved very rapidly uh, in conjunction with the, the capitalistic model and industrialisation, um, as did plant and the cost of plant. Plant, if you want to actually think about it, is a raw resource plus wages that creates virtually all plant and equipment. So you can apply the same rule. Those costs are flexible. And the, cost of pro the concept of profit did not exist a thousand years ago. It is a construct that's necessary under the capitalistic system. So when you have a good look at what puts the cost in stuff, you can see that they're negotiable. So, but we love money. You know, the capitalistic system, and we all grown up especially in the Western society, we've all grown up being conditioned to think about and value the capitalistic model as a, the answer to all our problems. And by, through capitalism, we're allowed and entitled to accumulate enormous wealth, um, big houses, boats, cars, etc., etc. But in reality, in a planet with seven billion people, that model of success really just equals greed. And it's not sustainable long term and it's not available equally to everybody and we need to look for a different and new way to value success. 
Um, so let's have a closer look at money because humanity has a very unusual relationship with money. If we look back at the, um, the Great Depression in the 1930s, um, we understand that millions of people went hungry and starved and cold and were out of work and it was a terrible, terrible time. But it was interesting during the Great Depression that everything that people truly needed was still there. The land was still there, the sun was still shining, the rain was still falling, the plants would still grow. But through the lack of money circulating, humanity stopped interacting and stopped functioning. So you can't eat money, but everybody went hungry when it wasn't available. So it's just an interesting relationship that humanity has developed in, its, uh, in regards to money. There was a time before money. A thousand years ago, if you check the history, there was very little money used. Um, many communities were still rural based, of course, and they worked together to create their needs, so the housing, the food, etc., etc., and they worked uh, collectively. And money was not exchanged, they just understood that they had to work together to, to, to make things happen. Money was used generally by kings to wage war, to effectively send people off to do things they didn't want to do. So yes, and the, um, money was around in the form of gold or silver, etc., but it was really used by, 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 by the pe people seeking greater power. Um, as time went by, gold and silver coins uh, were minted and, and the concept of exchange was adopted. Um, but gold and silver coins are very uh, heavy and they're, they're very easy to steal. So um, Robin Hood and Sherwood Forest would be waiting there to pinch the gold and it wasn't long before people thought it was much safer to leave the gold with the goldsmiths and the goldsmiths started issuing promissory notes. And the promissory notes became the, the unit of exchange. Rather than gold and silver, they'd hand the paper notes around. But everybody knew that that paper note at any time could be taken back to the goldsmith and it would be redeemed for an equal value of gold. There was real value behind that the promissory note. But what happened over time was the goldsmiths realised that 80% of the gold sitting in their safes that they were holding on behalf of their clients um, was never called upon. And it didn't take them long to realise that they could probably issue a few more promissory notes under, the, uh, under a loan arrangements with other people and they'd never get caught out. So long as they always had enough gold to meet the demand of the promissory notes being redeemed on any particular day, their business was safe and secure. And in fact, that's what occurred over a period of time. Um, so the goldsmiths quickly learned that if 80% of the gold was sitting there at any one time, they could loan out five times as many promissory notes. Um, and that has evolved over the last centuries into the fractional reserve banking system that exists globally today. And we'll explore that further in a minute. If we were to have a look, and you please uh, have a look at the chart um, uh, at the, up here at the moment, and you'll see up on the, the top uh, right left hand corner there's a hundred dollar bill which has just been released from the Reserve Bank of Australia and it might have been paid to a government worker in the form of wages etc. And that hundred dollar bill has just been deposited into Bank A. And so the bank now has a deposit of a hundred dollars. Now globally these banks are allowed to loan that money out and what they've been instructed to do and depending on where you are in the world they, they must keep a reserve of money um, on hand. Uh, some, uh, and generally speaking globally that ranges between about 4 and 12 percent. Uh, in uh, the UK they're shifting from 4 percent up to 8 percent reserves. Um, at the, just before the global financial crisis in America they got down to 3 percent. They're currently around 4 or to 8 percent uh, depending on where you are in America. C Australia currently sits on 8 percent. For the easy math we've used 10 percent reserves. So the hundred dollars that has been uh, deposited, the bank now knows it needs to hold on to ten dollars as a reserve, and it may loan out ninety dollars. Now, if that was all that, uh, uh, that was the end of the story, that would probably be okay because we've still got a hundred dollars in in action. But inevitably, the ninety dollars gets banked into Bank B, and Bank B follows the same rules, retains ten percent, and loans out um, eighty-one dollars and $81 carries on to the next bank and this cycle continues and continues and it's not very long before the $100 actually has been turned into $1,000 in circulation and that cycle can go on virtually indefinitely. And globally that has, is how most of our currency is created. Um, of all the printed money in the world today only 3% is actually in cash 
and 97% it was created electronically, either by the reserve banking system, um, the fractional reserve system that we've just explained today. So let's, so we can see the interesting thing is the banks in that whole equation haven't actually put any of their money into the, into the equation. All they're ever using is the deposit funds. And then through the tricky, uh, this uh, sophisticated relationship, managed to create money uh, and multiply it. But surely that $100 that came from the uh, government, that's got some real wealth behind it. Surely there's some gold or something, some serious asset behind that. Because what I see here today is there's nothing in particular of wealth behind the money the banks are creating. So we have a look back at the $100 that comes from the government and see how that is created today. Effectively, over the last 100 years, most governments in the world today have um, a, a adopted a reserve bank model. Australia, uh, the uh, Reserve Bank of Australia, uh, the Federal Reserve in America, uh, the Bank of England is under the same model, etc., etc. And effectively, what's occurred has the, is the governments over time were lobbied by by particular parties to allow a reserve bank to be set up. And the right of the reserve bank is it actually gets the opportunity to create the currency for the nation. Now, um, the, the surprising thing for most people is that these reserve banks are, are owned by the governments. They're not part of the governments. In, in Australia, uh, reserve bank is actually an agency of the government, which is better than most. The Federal Reserve Bank is actually owned, if you dig deep enough, by independent global bankers. So when America or Australia would like some more money, what generally what happens is they ring the Reserve Bank and say we'd like a, uh, an extra billion dollars and the Reserve Bank directors will say that's fine, you know what you need to do. Um, uh, send us over some of those Treasury bonds, we like those. So the um, Treasury will produce, uh, uh, prepare legal documents, Treasury bonds, which are supported by the wealth and the taxes of the nation. Um, and the, the bearer of those bonds will receive an annual dividend. Um, and so they are offered for sale. And basically, in, in most situations, the, the Treasury bonds are purchased by the reserve banks. The reserve banks then go, thank you very much. We need to pay you a billion dollars for these Treasury bonds that have just been, are now secured by the wealth of the nation. We'll go and get your money. And the arrangement they have there is they can simply, uh, in some senses, go out the back room and turn on a printing press and print a billion dollars. Just with paper and ink, create a billion dollars out of thin air and put that in a box and send it over to the Treasury. The reality is, in today's world, more than likely not, they'll sit at a computer screen and enter in one billion dollars into a computer screen and transfer that to the government. And that will be all they put into the equation. So they have just effectively purchased one billion dollars of the, wealth, the nation's wealth for nothing more than a couple of keystrokes on a, uh, on a computer screen. And that, unfortunately, is the unfortunate truth of how our money is created around the world. Um, I grew up, and I'm sure most people uh, think the same way, the more money we have in the world, the wealthier we are. The reality is, the more money we have in the world, the poorer we are, where the more of the, our nation's wealth we have sold off to elite few uh, at the top of the banking spectrum. So, and there's no gold anymore. The, um, in 1971, I believe, uh, Nixon unhinged the US dollar from uh, the gold reserves in America, which effectively unhinged the, the, the global monetary system from gold. Um, so, where does money come from and what is it today? Money is debt. The more money we have in, to in today, the more, debted, the more indebted we are. Uh, every time Greece managed to borrow another $200 billion, really all they've managed to do is transfer another $200 billion worth of Greek assets to the banks. And that's all that's really occurring. So, where does money come from? It comes out of thin air. And that's a scary, uh, scary, but it's a reality. That's, it's true, and that's in, uh, throughout the globe today. And if you think about what the international monetary funds and world banks and etc. are trying to do, they're trying to make sure all the third world start borrowing more and more money, circulate more and more uh, money globally, effectively indebting the world. So Thomas Jefferson, back in um, uh, back in 1802, uh, uh, had this to say: um, "I believe that the banking institutions are more dangerous than our." Than, to our liberties than standing armies. 
if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and the corporations that will grow up around the banks will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless in the continent their fathers conquered. Now that was a warning from 200 years ago and unfortunately that is a reality we live in today. We'd like to think our governments or our international corporations might protect us from this, uh, this, uh, this happening, stop it from happening, and they should be stopping it from happening. But our, or they should be looking after our planet, which is the number one thing. If we don't look after a planet, we will not survive. We must look after our environment, otherwise it cannot sustain us. But unfortunately, looking after the planet will probably not be profitable. And so um, we know that the banks, the big, big business and banks, will not be interested in looking after the planet because all they're interested in is profit or circulating more money. We'd like to think the governments would save us, but the reality is most of our governments get into power through support of big business and big money. And so the only way to influence the governments is by votes. And the trouble is for the votes to actually occur and start making decisions on this matter, the people must know about what's going on. And the unfortunate reality is that the um, big business, big money controls the mass media. Um, it being press, TV and radio and, the, and popular um, mediums. Um, when was the last time you heard, heard or saw a very, very scary story about climate change or anything about the money supply system? You will not hear it on the, on the mainstream medias. Please get on the internet and re in, um, research this yourselves. You'll find it's true and it's very, very scary what's happening globally. So just to summarise, we cannot keep doing what we've done. Money is debt and corrupts our thinking. Um, the capitalist system, capitalistic system is core to the problem. We cannot or will not address the environmental challenges ahead of us unless we look at our capitalistic model that we all live under. And governments and big business are not going to save us. We need to do this, this ourselves. This movement or a change must come from the people. So. Where, how could we change this? What, what, what's a way to, to change, uh, bring around change in the world today? So let's look at something that is relevant to everybody uh, probably in, uh, watching to this uh, presentation, is homes and, and the debt, or how the home mortgages, etc. Uh, on this slide here, you can see I've got a house that was built in the 1950s, and we suggest it was probably built for about $5,000. And that house was probably lived in by the people who built it for about 20 years. And about 1970, it was sold for $30,000. Now, what would have occurred at that time is the person who wanted to buy that house probably only had a small deposit, maybe 10 or 20 percent uh, of the amount, so uh, maybe $6,000. And he and his wife would have headed off to the bank and impressed the bank manager that they were one a responsible citizen, they were hard working, they had stable jobs and they were committed to paying the bank back their money over the next 30 years. They would toil hard and long to pay back the bank and the bank would, after much consideration, decide to buy the house, because that's who actually buys the house is the bank, and put the mortgagee in the mortgage or into, mortgagee, sorry, into uh, the house um, with a monthly payment that's found for the next three decades. But that person would have worked hard and uh, 20 years later had the opportunity to sell that house and thought it was a very good opportunity because they probably sold it for about $300,000 due to inflation over the time because the banks have managed to keep on pushing more and more money into our societies. Um, but the same process would have occurred. A new person would have turned up, gone to the bank, wanting to borrow over $200,000 to buy the same house with the same pledge, I will work hard and long and pay you back your money over the next 20, 30 years. So the bank would have bought that, next, that house and put the next person to work for them paying their interest on top of the money they have loaned them. And it would have occurred again another 20 years later and that same house was probably sold for $800,000. Now, the one thing that's constant in there is the banks receiving profits from interest. What's also common in there is people working hard paying off debt for more than 60 odd years and that uh, sequence of events will reoccur for hundreds of years in the future and we'll soon be talking millions if not tens of millions of dollars in debt on that one house. 
So you can see what's happening there, and the reality is our process of buying a house, paying back the banks, reselling it, and allowing the next person to lock into debt is re-indebting every generation. We're effectively repaying off every past housing developed again and again and again. And who really benefits out of that? The banks long term. The chart I've got up here today is um, uh, the, the uh, bank loans or debt in, within Australia and the red line there shows us the uh, mortgage debts in Australia. And you can see it outstrips um, a business debt considerably by probably 30 uh, percent. The other interesting thing there, and it's steeply growing, it's, 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 it's not going to slow down. The other interesting um, uh, line on there is personal debt, which is the blue line right down the bottom. The one thing to, which is interesting in that is that the banks understand that um, uh, personal loans cover off holidays and cars and TVs. The banks can't seize holidays, cars and TVs and really get a great value back. So they always keep a very close relationship between personal debt and, and wages. And you can see the, the steady growth in personal loans. Now if you were to draw a line in parallel to that or slightly higher than that, you'd get where wages sit during that whole period. Now look at the relationship between wages, where wages would be and the red line above. Now there's an ever widening gap between house mortgages or prices and wages and it's accelerated over the last 20 years. What we mean by that is the affordability of housing is, is getting out of the reach of many, many people. So to summarise, every generation is cu currently repaying off all the past um, home uh, residential developments. The banks in fact inflate the prices of houses because they're in the business of loaning money. If they can convince each generation that invest in this expensive house because we're going to make sure the prices go up even more so you'll make a profit when you sell it. Um, this, that process forever widens the gap between housing and wages and effectively enslaves every generation of debt. Now here's a different story. Same house but a different system in, at play. Let's say we built a house in the 1950s for $5,000 and we paid it off in the 1960s. So only $5,000 was involved. And that house, 20 years later, after the people who built it um, had moved out, somebody else moved in and effectively was gifted to the Joneses. Now the Joneses lived in there and brought up their children in that home for the next 20 years. And, um, and then tr transferred it or gifted it to the Cardonis who had uh, just started their family and were raised their children in the same house for the next 20 years. And then eventually the same house was gifted to the Changs in 2012. Now, of course, for a house to be gifted from one family to another, there must be a relationship between all those families and the home that um, may allows that to happen. But if you have a look at that chart, there's only $5,000 that has ever been spent. How much money do we actually need? $5,000 for all of those families over 60 years to live enjoyably in that house. The only, person, the only um, entity not included in that picture is the banks. Now, I don't think uh, the banks were adding a great deal to the last picture. Oh, the la there's one more piece to this puzzle, is that the people who originally built the house and gave the house originally off to the Joneses needed somewhere else to go and live. So we would have had the gift of those people a nice retirement home probably on the beach somewhere. So you could probably add another 10000 or $20,000 to the, the whole equation. Now, we're looking at maybe thirty to $40,000 with this picture compared to um, well over 1.2 million plus interest, so probably a couple of million dollars in the previous equation. So which one looks more friendly and one that you'd want to be associated with? I think you'd probably find this is the way to go. So how do we break the cycle of debt? It really is a situation where there's a period of time where we're virtually all debt free, leading up to our, you know, maybe our 20s or early 30s. But then for most of us, we have to lock into taking on jobs, taking on mortgages, looking after our families, etc. And so you run through a period from maybe 35 to 55 where most of us, or many of us, are basically tied up in debt for a big chunk of our lives. And then it's only in the later years, maybe in the 60s or 65 plus, that we start coming out of the debt as we sell our homes, etc., that we might have some money to spare. So the majority of our mature adult lives are spent in debt, working very, very hard for the banks. Now, if we're going to have any hope 
of breaking this cycle of death. We need to work together. We need the mature um, 50, 60 plus who have some wealth to help stop the younger generation, the uh, you know the 15s to 35s, from going into debt. And part of what we're talking about today is exactly that. And then it's very quickly you can actually break this cycle of debt. So reality check before we go any further. All wealth comes from the planet, and what we mean by that is everything that uh, we use today comes from the planet eventually. Um, so we either dig it up, chop it down, or catch it. They say a laptop computer actually begins with 40,000 tonnes of raw materials. Everything's refined down and eventually it turns into a laptop computer. But it all starts at the planet. Of course, we take those raw materials and add low know-how and labour, um, e.g. the know-how to build, take raw materials into a laptop. Um, and that is exactly where all wealth is created. From, from the planet plus labour, we create wealth. Um, ver need versus greed. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi um, said uh, there is su sufficiency in the world for man's need, but not for man's greed. And if we look globally, that has never been truer. With seven billion plus people on the planet today, we need to have a new paradigm. Uh, searching uh, to have multiple houses, big cars, um, boats, etc., is not a realistic ideal for the, the world today. We need to focus on needs of people. Okay. Money creates an illusion of scarcity and promotes competition and greed. Now let's focus on the illusion of scarcity. The, there's two sides to that. One is money is kept reasonably scarce for the majority of us because then it keeps us motivated. Once you've got four or five million dollars, money doesn't really motivate you anymore. But for most of us, that's not going to be a reality. So it's intentionally kept scarce. Wages are kept low, etc., so that we keep us working. The other thing about um, the monetary system, or particularly the capitalistic model, is it promotes scarcity. And what I mean by that is, because of the supply and demand um, model, is that it's actually beneficial to create high demand and limited supply, and therefore you can keep prices up and profits up. Uh, so. So the capitalistic model will never promote true abundance in the true sense of the word. Uh, and a good example of that was uh, uh, recently cabbage growers were ploughing the cabbages back into the field because to, to harvest them and send them the, to market um, would have cl created a collapse in the prices and, the, the, and therefore ruined the business for everybody in the, uh, out there. But rea it was because, only because of the profit model, the capitalistic model, that we didn't have an abundance of, of cabbages that we could all enjoy. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can run that across everything. It applies to diamonds down to cabbages. The same rule applies. The other thing with money and the whole concept of money, it will logically brings out the worst in humanity. For as long as we maintain a unit uh, of currency which represents stored wealth, um, it's logical that human, every human will go, okay, if that's a, a store of wealth, I want as much of that as possible because that represents security. And therefore, it's logical for each human to say, if I want as much of that, I'm willing to do all sorts of things for that. And therefore, competition and greed are logical consequences of the concept of money. If you really want to, um, uh, for humanity to evolve, and that's what we're talking about, an evolution, not a revolution here, we need to think outside of square and actually move past and into a new model where money is no longer required. Now how could that ever happen? Now the reality is, um, uh, the key to uh, ever having uh, a world without money is abundance. Once you've got an abundance of everything, it's uh, uh, th that model becomes quite realistic. Now. Here's a concept that uh, has been promoted by the Earth Group and we have yet to have anyone dispute it. The idea is that one indi any of every individual through the application of a reasonable amount of service um, with the help of know-how and technology can create far more than they could possibly consume themselves. For example, a vegetable grower with a, um, applying a reasonable amount of effort can grow far more vegetables than they can possibly consume themselves. A farmer can grow far more grain than they can consume themselves. A baker can bake more bread than they can possibly consume. A dressmaker can make more dresses. A mechanic can fix more cars. A house a builder can build more houses than they can possibly live in. And therefore, so as long as everybody is willing to commit to a reasonable amount of effort and service, if we work together, we can have true abundance of everything. 
It's just a matter of commitment as a service. Unfortunately, in a place like Australia, it's very easy through natural resources to create abundance. So abundance is natural. You've just got to be willing to apply effort and technology to do it. Now here's the big leap or the big new paradigm under the Earth Community um, uh, model is we currently live in a live to get world um, and we'll talk about that in a moment and we're suggesting that it's time to move to a live to give model. Let's examine that. So currently very, very little happens in this world unless, somebody, uh, unless you negotiate with somebody what you're going to get for what I'm about to do you. So if you go to someone's place and go, I'll mow your lawn, the first thing you want to know is how much you're going to pay me for do that. That's a live to get model. So, and effectively, we live that model. And so it's every individual uh, is out for himself. So they, uh, we have the image of the knight going off the battle on the horse. And so we all go out to do battle to get ourselves as much of this good money stuff that we possibly can. Um, and we, we hoard that we grab as much money as we can, come home, and at some later date, we take that money out and we give ourselves something. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, if you fall off your horse on the way to battle, um, and uh, there's not too much getting going on that day. And so it's a very uh, threatening uh, and survival-based model. Um, you're always on the defensive, you're always on the aggressive. It's, it's, it's not a relaxing model at all. Now here's a different suggestion. What about if we all work together and let's say a baker went to work and he baked all the bread for the day and he put it out on the shelves and he said, there you go, take what you need. Take as much as you need, come back tomorrow and get some more fresh bread. No point in taking everything, just take what you need. And then the baker walks out and he wanders over to the cafe and has a coffee. Now the coffee is given to him freely because the bakery and the and the coffee house have a relationship and of course the bread from the bakery goes over the coffee house and etc and so he gets his coffee for free and then he walks home past the fruit and veg shop and collects some fruit and veg but because he has a relationship with the fruit and veg shop he just gets what he needs and then eventually walks into a house which was gifted to him because a part of the, the network of people he works with that was a collective asset and he lives there and so all he has to do to have everything he needs is be willing to give service to others. So you create a one-to-many, many-to-one relationship, which is far more robust than a one-to-one. -one. And we've heard it through about the eons. As you sow, so shall you reap. We've been told so many different ways. Um, and this is a very natural process, and there's no reason why this can't work. So when you start thinking about what's value or what's worth, what, what comes to mind? Because it's an interesting question that I'm not too sure too many people think about. And we've, we've asked a lot of people, and then these are the reoccurring themes that come out. Firstly, if you can have time to spend with your family, with your children, with your parents, with your, your greater family, that is of great wealth. And so many people, especially in today's world, have very little time to spend with their family. Fathers leave the home at six o'clock in the morning, get home at six o'clock at night. Mothers having to drop kids at childcare um, from six months on, just so they, they can go and earn the second income to pay the mortgage. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the first things we think is important, time to enjoy your life with your family. And then also time to enjoy life with your friends. Imagine if you could just spend more time each week catching up, being social, enjoying your interests, et cetera, spending time with friends. Of course, good food, good healthy food is vital. Having a purpose or reason, um, a benefit you can give to others is of immense value. Um, the other things that come to mind are very practical, productive land, land that we can uh, use to meet our needs, whether it be building materials, more food, etc., etc. Um, good quality housing that uh, um, is available and energy efficient and long lasting, etc. Tools that work, great technologies, etc., that we're uh, available to us, and the opportunity to develop and explore ourselves, to, to whether it be educational or physical um, development or spiritual development, doesn't matter, whatever you're, you're, you would like to uh, evolve and develop about yourself. Now, most of the people we've spoken to, if you had all of those things, good food, good housing, more time with your friends and family, good purpose, uh, great tools and the opportunity to grow, um, most people say, if I had all that, I'd be very happy, I'd be wealthy, in the true sense of the word. Um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and I know many people have heard about this, but effectively it talks about as one 
one um, person's level of needs is met, they, uh, they start beginning to con be concerned about the next level of needs. Um, uh, so uh, fundamentally it starts off at food and shelter and water, etc. But And under the Live to Give model, we promote that you start at that level. Once you look after the food supply and housing and water, etc., um, and that's not hard to, to, to achieve in, in our society today. Many people, you can tick that box very quickly under the Live to Give model. Uh, the next one is safety and security, health and employment and property and family and social stability. The Live to Give model gives you that very, very, very quickly. As you, almost as you tick the food box, you've already ticked the second one and it just keeps rolling up. Loving belonging, you work with a team of people assisting and giving to one another. Loving belonging is a natural part of that. Self-esteem, again, just a natural con consequence. And self-actualisation, which is where we get the opportunity to give to others that, that, that special service or special talent that was within us to give that freely and live to give will create that for, for so many people. So you can see on, a, on how to create happiness, the whole live to give model is a fantastic road to happiness. Now I know and I'm sure everybody uh, listening to this today knows we can't walk away from money straight away, it's just not going to happen. I will need money tomorrow to get home, to buy fuel, to have food, etc. But if we plan and work together, we can actually move away from money in time. So we live in a world today of all money, but if we reduce our debt and focus on not recreating debt, we can reduce the need for money greatly. If we learn how to work with one another and create structures where we can learn to give and interact with one another without money, we need less money and it just keeps on going. And it took three, four hundred years to get us into the situation we have today, it, but I think we can get out a whole lot quicker if we're willing to work together and have a focus and it's to a much better end. So, what is the Earth communities promoting? What's the model that we're suggesting? It's really quite simple. We're suggesting that um, we, by utilising a traditional company structure, um, we will create a scenario where people may join the company and, and joining or shareholding is gained through service rather than investment in money. Um, but uh, and one of the key things is every shareholder gets an equal shareholding. You can't buy or sell or trade these shares. What you're issued when you join is yours for life. You can't accumulate them or have more than anyone else, just everybody's equal. Um, the company is about acquiring and holding um, uh, assets being houses, land, businesses, etc. And they have, all the assets are, uh, are acquired for the benefit of the shareholders. Now the shareholders have to commit to service, so the company is actually about running quite a lot of enterprises, diverse range of enterprises. In fact, all the enterprises needed to meet the needs of all the shareholders. And, the, and, and those services and goods are freely available to all the shareholders. They effectively, you take whatever you need. Not what you want, but what you need. But the key thing to this whole model is that every one of those enterprises trade with the outside society, those that are not part of this community, uh, and we trade for money. And so therefore, we're generating substantial revenues into the organisation. The only thing that's different is how we use the money once it's uh, received. The key thing that we'll be doing, obviously we don't use quite so money internally because everything's freely available, so wages are a, have a take on a different model. Um, what we do with the money is buy in for the community what um, we can't produce ourselves and we focus on paying off debt, e.g. accumulating revenue and giving it back to the banks to pay off home mortgages, land debt, etc, etc, and never in debt, re-indebting those homes ever again. Now, um, this model can apply to virtually anything and everything. We are starting at the basics of life, of food and shelter um, and clothing, etc. But you can roll it into anything. It only needs a group of people with resources and virtually anything in this world is possible. Um, we've modelled this so it's not um, uh, geologically um, uh, constricted e.g. there's no boundaries, it doesn't need to be in a compound or uh, uh, isolated location. It can be one house on a street, it can be one business in a town, it can be a farm in, in one area, um, but all working together under a, a common ownership model. 
Now the cafe, let's say we have one town where there's a cafe and so this is an example of one town, two systems at play. So the coffee shop is there and it sells coffee. And uh, somebody off the street drives into town and sits down and would like to have a coffee, they just pay cash as you normally would. Um, and the, the coffee is served to them by the people that are working the cafe and more than likely not a, a part owners in that cafe. And then, then Joe the baker who's just finished baking bread, who's just knocked off work, walks in the door, sits down and has a coffee for free. Why? Because he's also a part owner in that cafe, as the people that are running the cafe are part owners in the bakery. And so all he's doing is enjoying one of the services available through his network of businesses. The objective of the Earth Communities Project is to bring together people with diverse skills and resources um, from diverse backgrounds to uh, operate and run many commercial enterprises. Um, uh, so this, the, all the community members actually provide service and, and work into the enterprises to create wealth for the community. And the wealth is used to acquire um, property and houses and assets, etc., which will be held in trust long term, for which are then enjoyed by the community members. And if you imagine what that would be like after 50 to 100 years, it gets very, very powerful. Imagine what Australia would be like if we had this system running for the last 100 years. There would be no debt. There'd be no such thing as debt. And we'd have, a, uh, we'd have wealth, mind-boggling wealth, true wealth. Um, uh, just just diverse, uh, uh, digress for a while. The model we've talked about, uh, we're told to aspire to today is work hard, buy yourself a house and get yourself a beach house and get yourself a yacht and get yourself a plane, etc. And, and we all go off to acquire that. But you talk to anyone honestly who have all those things and they say they're not that enjoyable because to have a house and a beach house and a boat means you've got to maintain a beach house and a boat and a plane, etc., which is endless cost. And the reality is you end up working um, just as hard for your assets rather than enjoying your life. And so the true way to enjoy the material wealth is not to own it solely by yourself, but own it collectively with others. So have a, um, a group of beach houses owned by the community, and when you want to use one, ring up the person whose job is to look after the beach houses on, on, uh, as a, a commercial enterprise and go, I'd like to come down on the weekend and have Saturday and Sunday nights down there. And they just book you in. You don't have to pay. It's run as an enterprise and it's a free day available and you don't have to worry about the water heater or mowing the lawns or anything else. Now that is true wealth. The vision long term is as we reduce our debts, we will get our time back. And as we reduce our debts and we get our time back we'll, and, and move away from the capitalistic model, we'll be able to get into a situation where when we're posed with a question or a challenge or a, an option about what we should do, e.g. save the rainforest, we'll be able to choose the right thing to do. We won't have to worry about the financial um, ramifications or uh, increasing demand and consumption. It just won't be an issue because it, it won't come into thinking. We'll be able to think long term and the long term decision in, in all cases will come down to this. We must look after our planet. If we do not look after the environment we live in, it will not be able to support us. So the number one thing to do is look after our planet. So that in a thousand years time is a lovely place to be. And in a thousand years time it will support all the animals that live on it today, as well as providing a wonderful, enjoyable place for us to, our children in the years to come to live. And that should be what we should be working for. And that is true wealth. So the question is, we know we can, but will we? You know, the key, the thing is, hum, humans have been told that we have dominion over everything that uh, walk upon the earth. Now with that sort of power comes a lot of responsibility. So um, we have the choice. We know we can do whatever we like to do, but what will we do? Or more importantly, I know I can, but what will I do personally? Now launching new ideas um, is always challenging, and, but the reality is you don't need to launch a new idea to everybody all at once. Um, the reality is yeah, if you have a look at the bell curve here, the, um, uh, the innovation adoption life cycle, you'll see it, the community as a whole is broken into um, a number of sectors. 
Uh, the smallest one is the innovators, and these are the guys and girls that just want the newest, craziest, wonderful thing that's about to hit the market. They are willing to, um, uh, willing to go through all sorts of pain and increased costs to, to have their thing. Um, the next group are the early adopters, and that, these guys are very important to uh, uh, promoters of technology, etc., in that they, um, they are the ones that bring, alert the mass market to the new trend, be it the iPod or the iPad or whatever's new and fancy. And then after that you get into the early majority, late majority, etc. But the key for launching an idea like Earth Communities is, a, is communicating and reaching the innovators and early adopters. So truly, up to 15, 20% 20, 20 of the community is all that we need to actually reach or motivate under this strategy. And so that's who we are targeting. Um, that means two people out of every 10 we're hoping to find uh, the go, willing to give this a go. How are we beginning? We've um, got uh, legal advisors on our team and we're um, selecting the correct uh, corporate entity. And we're currently out talking to people um, uh, with the opportunity to bring in people and money. We need a bit of both at this point in time. What will we be doing with the money when it comes and people? Because firstly, we're, we're, we're currently writing the business plans to create a small scale commercial garden. And this will be a market garden which will um, start on several acres to start with, um, but hopefully we will go to 10 or 20 acres. And the idea is there to produce a lot of um, uh, organically grown fruit and vegetables which will be available to all our community members. And as our suppliers of fruit and vegetables grow, we plan to open a cafe restaurant. Now, the people that will be working on the farm and working in the cafes will be actually shareholders in the company and therefore they'll be working in their own businesses. They won't be buying their way in, they'll, buy, they'll earn their shareholding through service to the organisation. And we'll use these two businesses to test our model, to create the rule book. Um, and that's really what we're about. We're creating a pathway so many people can follow this. Um, we will document everything and make it freely available to anybody to, to download from our website. And our hope is that we will resolve any, um, any issue or any challenge that comes our way. And our next program is actually to um, accumulate a little bit more money, a few more people, and we'll actually go out and purchase a, um, a large scale farm, probably uh, 500 to 1,000 acres on which we'll run a full um, range of agricultural endeavours, be it, you know, making wine or running chickens or um, uh, orchards, etc, etc. But in conjunction with a, a, the operating farm or working farm, we're actually going to create a residential um, housing estate, which will be focused at creating um, retirement housing for people you know, in the 55, 65 regime, e.g. those with some capital behind them. And we're going to use their capital to build houses on the farms, which will create a lovely environment for them to their retirement. Um, but it will be the community members, skilled members of the community, um, uh, con construction industry experts, that will build the houses. And But under our model, we will actually create quite a lot of profit, which will then go on to build more houses for community members, etc. Now, you put that whole model together, you've got um, people working on the farm, running, uh, producing a whole range of um, primary produce and secondary produce, um, uh, bakeries, etc., etc. A residential uh, community where retirees can choose to be involved in the farming life if they like, um, on, on large scale land, so there are all sorts of resources, and all of those people being able to work together where the uh, community members are, are caring and looking after retirees and vice versa. Um, and that model, we, we, we are getting an amazing interest in it already. So our initial arms is to create a lot of jobs, we'll become self-funded reasonably quickly. We are, we are about trying to find a pathway and we'll share whatever we learn with everybody freely. Um, this is not about personal wealth, but it is about collective wealth. Our aim is to reduce debt and produce lots of food, build lots of houses and provide safe retirements for an important sector of our community. Um, which also makes sure that we're exposing the skills and knowledge of that, um, the mature um, part, sectors of Australia with the young to make sure the skills and knowledge they've acquired over decades of experience is not lost, but in fact it's, a, it's uh, transferred to the next generation. 
Future realities, we can see this could go and will likely go everywhere. Where when you start um, centralising the energy bills of lots and lots of people, you quickly end up with a very large amount of money to invest um, in uh, renewable energy projects. Um, we will be very focused on technology um, uh, of all sorts. We should be driving electric cars, etc. And so we will be very focused on renewable energy and low environmentally friendly technologies. Education and health are very natural follow-ons from this uh, project. Um, food production, recreation, design. When you start thinking about there's really no limit to where this is going, but it, it's just start it slowly. Once you get food and housing and transport and communication covered off, all sorts of things become possible. And really, at the end of the day, we're not changing much. All we're doing is changing the ownership model. We've been told throughout our life we need to go out and build every, all wealth for me or my family. It's about me, me, me. And all we're suggesting is create wealth for the we, the collective we. And at the end of the day, when you focus on that, everything we've talked about here is, 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 is a realistic possibility. And that's what we're out to do. And that's all we're changing is the ownership model from me to we. Um, we are in challenging times and we need many people to begin acting as one and this is a pathway for doing just that. Um, our, our, we are in a war, whether or not you understand it or acknowledge it or not, there's a war going on between money and the world and we must look after the world, we must get on the side of the planet um, because money is not real, it is the enemy and it's, it's the tool of our elite few to do their bidding. Um, our aim right now is to find 100 people who can loan up to uh, $10,000 each. We will, um, to raise a million dollars to get the first two projects underway. Um, we are accepting um, donations or loans as well. Um, we'll take amounts uh, as little as uh, $1,000. Um, you can visit uh, our website to make those contributions to help us get this underway. Or take this information and to bring it into your own, area, um, own uh, communities. What's in it for somebody who's um, uh, assisting this project with, with money um, is we'll provide a 5% return on the loans um, in the way of products and services, not so much cash because where we're going, cash uh, money can't make money. If you understand the rules of, uh, of commerce or economics, money should not be able to create more money. It's just impossible. Gold, you put it, leave it alone, it doesn't create more gold, money shouldn't create more money. Um, but products and services, we, we, will, um, uh, we believe that's exactly what should be paid back for the use of someone's money. The loans will re be, be repaid because they are viewed as debt. As far as in our eyes, the loans are viewed as debt and must be repaid. And you'll be helping making um, a great change which is needed globally. Um, we need, uh, they need, we do need some money to get things started, but we also need people. Um, this is a combination of human skills and capital that need to get this underway, and eventually we'll need people that are willing to, or interested in actually investing in the residential properties, um, and farming properties, etc. There's many different uh, industry sectors and enterprises that will grow out of this, and the exact order of them is, 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 is not set in stone. It can take many different pathways. Um, but we need people to lead the change. Someone, we need people who are willing to step out of the, the, the conditioned mentality that we've been uh, told that is the only option and step into a new reality. Because we're not about a revolution, but we are about an evolution in human thinking. And uh, there's so many reasons to do this for the planet, for the animals, and for our children. So um, thank you very much. Uh, please visit... Uh, um, uh, earthcommunities.com.au we'll be posting lots of information on there from uh, in the months to come and uh, please follow us on Facebook um, this is the start of something we hope that will go on for decades if not centuries into the future thank you very much